it is 3.30 and I don't, I wanna be very respectful for everyone's time. So I am Martha Nowak. I am K-12 Engagement Coordinator at Kansas State University in Olathe, our Olathe campus. And I was a classroom science teacher for 35 years before taking on this challenge. Uh, and it is, gives me an opportunity to maintain that contact with classroom te teachers and uh, also have an alliance with the Manhattan campus and invite guest speakers to come and address uh, general public on um, cases and careers in veterinary medicine. Uh, today we have with us Dr. Justin Thomason. He's an associate professor, clinical professor at cardiology in Manhattan. And uh, we are very fortunate to have his expertise. And I think it's very interesting to look at uh, cardiology in our pets yeah. and look at- um, Tell him you're what? CC Spoon, you're on live I'm and sleeping. we're recording. CC's iPhone, if you would please mute, we are recording. Uh, we've begun the lecture. Thank you for joining us. Um, and so uh, without further ado, we've uh, started the recording and I introduce to you, Dr. Justin Thomason. Thank you for being here with us. Well, thank you guys for having me. And I'll kind of go a little bit on my background. The way that I structured this is I put it together as a, because I teach mostly third year veterinary students and fourth year veterinary students. So it's a four year program. So we have first, second, third, fourth year veterinary students. Um, I mainly interact with the third and fourth year students. So I'm going to kind of go through what that part of the curriculum looks like. And then I'm going to present a case and kind of go through a lecture with you, if you will. It'll be a, a shortened lecture, just so you can see the type of lectures that we do in, in vet med. So if you have questions, let me know. And then certainly uh, I'll answer those as we, as we get going. Okay, let's see if this thing is going to... So the outline, we're gonna do program ob objectives. So kind of the third year program, um, the curriculum, um, we do cardiology rounds. I'm gonna go over a lecture with you and we're gonna do a little Kahoot towards the end. So I've got that listed, that Kahoot.it, you're probably familiar with that. And then the pin number, if you don't mind joining, there's just going to be a little short, got like two or three questions that we'll finish with at the end, just to make it a little interactive. And that will be kind of fun. So that pin numbers 105732. So if you'd please join, that would be awesome. And we'll pick that up at the end of the, of the talk. So I'm originally from Oklahoma. So I grew up in Southwest Oklahoma. Um, I did veterinary medicine. I completed the program at Oklahoma State University. Um, and I've been at Kansas State for nine, going on 10 years. And um, that's my son, Will. So I was worried because I did some training at Georgia, came from Oklahoma. So one of the things that we say is that we're Sooners because Oklahoma Sooner State. So I'm a Sooner by birth, um, cowboy, Oklahoma State Cowboys by choice, my DVM, and then we're Wildcats by the grace of God. So we really love Kansas State University. I love Manhattan. Um, I believe the program that we have, not only veterinary medicine, but I think the programs all across the, the university are, are very, um, they help people develop into the goals they want to achieve. So I think that's, that's important. And it's certainly, I heard of the K-State family, but once I got here, you certainly experienced that. And I think um, that's one of the things I really love about this community and the university itself is that, that family feeling that we have. So if you ever come to Manhattan, please look me up. I'd be happy to show you the veterinary teaching hospital and kind of go through the, the give you a little tour of the, of the school as well, or the hospital. So the program, the veterinary medicine program as a totality, 
you know, we try to encourage lifelong learning. We want to maintain or encourage enthusiasm for the profession. Um, we want to teach students to not only develop the foundational knowledge. So the first three years of the program, we develop the foundation. So we kind of go through, quote unquote, the basics. Um, and then once you get to third to fourth year, you got to apply that to patients. So we, we focus on that in that third and fourth year is taking that knowledge that you've acquired through those first, second years and starting to apply it to clinical patients. Um, we want to improve your communication skills, promote patient care. So very important that, that we take really good care of the patients. And then we encourage self-improvement and encourage preparedness. Let me check the chat here, I'm sorry. And okay, we're good. So the curriculum itself, um, the third year curriculum, here's some of the courses that, that we have. The good thing about the program is not only can you become a practitioner that practices in a community, you can also use that degree program to do other stuff as well. So for me, I do cardiology, of course, so you can specialize. And of course, I'm in academia. So I use my degree not only to do veterinary medicine, but I get to teach um, others. They do military. There's uh, public health. That's certainly a hot topic with, with the uh, pandemic that we've had. So there's lots of different avenues that that DVM degree would allow you to do. Most of the time, most people do practice and they, they do uh, vet man in a community and, and do dogs and cats, but you can do exotics, zoo animals. There's food, ag practices. There's lots of opportunities with the degree. The third year, the courses, again, we're transitioning from that foundational knowledge to clinical application. So trying to apply that, we're starting to get more hands-on. So they do surgery, we have medicine, and you can see that they do endocrine, neurology, ophthalmology, um, dermatology, so the study of skin, the study of the airways, respiratory, the study of blood, hematology. There's that exotic zoo. They do reproduction, theriogenology. They get an ethics course, and then there's an ag practice in that fall semester. In the spring semester, they're focusing on medicine too, we call it. So they do um, conditions that affect the kidney and bladder, so urology, small intestine, stomach, gastrointestinal conditions, cardiac, so heart, and then oncology, the study of neoplasia, cancers. And then they do equine, they get another surgery, and then they do nutrition. So there's a good program there that they're, we're using to transition from that foundational knowledge and applying it to those clinical patients when, once you get to the fourth year. What do the students say about the curriculum? Well, it's time demanding the third year. So there's very few exams the third year, but they're doing more hands-on. So they're doing more interaction with animals. So that takes a lot of time because they have that patient care, but they're also having to study for exams that they do have. Um, it's exhausting, as you can imagine. It's very, a uh, lot of hard work that the third years do and it's physical and mental. Um, so that's something that we try to focus on as, as the professors, we try to look and look at ways to help and kind of ease that for the students. But even though it's challenging and time demanding, they say it's very rewarding. So they love that the opportunity that they have to take care of patients and nurse those patients back to health, that's very rewarding. And of course the program, as we mentioned, it's very diverse. So it's very interesting regardless of your, whatever you plan to do with that degree once you finish. So here's my son, Will. And again, we're trying to take that third year and try to apply that foundational knowledge. So 
you can see where he's confused. He's like, God, do I smile, frown? And that's kind of the students, once you have that foundational knowledge, and then we want to get it where it's real clear, really, um, you have that knowledge right at your fingertips, and you know how to apply it to patients once you get to that fourth year of the curriculum. As we said, it's very stressful. So here's my cat, Petey, and he's hiding in a, a little bread box there. You can see his eyes come up and his tail wag. Um, it's gonna be, it's stressful. It's very time demanding. Um, you have to put in a lot of hard work and we realize that as a profession and we look for ways to make it fun. So we, we have a fitness center now that's located in the veterinary complex. We have a, a coffee shop that has coffee and sandwiches. Um, we have little opportunities that we get together with faculty and students so that we can get away from that hospital environment and participate in the community and, and work together and kind of take care of some of that stress and ease that for the students. So very important that we do that. And I'm glad that we have the opportunity to do that as well. So here's my chickens and ducks. And this was just a reminder that, yeah, it's a lot of hard work. Once we get up in the morning, you really have to start working. And I want to show you a typical lecture that we would have in vet med. And it's going to be on pacemakers. And I love teaching. And I wanna go through this with you. My goal is to have you being able to interpret an electrocardiogram, ECG, that measures the electrical activity of the heart. When we're finished with this exercise, this little um, program that I'm going through, I want you to be able to look at an electrocardiogram and be able to interpret it. And that's my goal. And we'll find out once we get to the end when we do the Kahoot. So I told my wife, yep, I'm going to teach them how to read electrocardiograms. And she's like, oh, you're a nerd. This is going to really upset them. This is going to be difficult. And I said, I'm going to try it. And I want to make you guys learn this and see how you can do. So the heart, as you know, it's a muscle. And that muscle contracts in order to pump blood to deliver nutrients to the tissues. In order for it to contract, it's got to be electrically excited. So there's cells in the heart that contract to pump blood, but there's also cells that electrically excite that heart muscle so that it does contract. So it's got to be electrically excited before it will contract. And that's the electrocardiogram, the EKG, they call it in people. It's the same thing. We call it an ECG, electrocardiogram. Um, and that looks at the electrical activity of the heart to say, okay, is the electrical system of the heart working? Doesn't tell us that the muscle's contracting well, tells us nothing about how well it's contracting. It just tells us if that electrical activity is working like it should. So we're gonna look at these electrical impulses and complexes. I'm gonna teach you how to evaluate a heart rate on an electrocardiogram. I'm gonna show you a case that where the conduction system, these cells that excite the heart where they're not working properly. And I'll show you how we repaired that in a case. And then we'll answer any questions that you have. So as we mentioned the heart, and I'm gonna do the mammalian heart. We got a right, we got four chambers. Right atrium pumps blood to the right ventricle. And then the right ventricle pumps blood to the lungs to receive oxygen. Once it receives oxygen, that blood returns to the left atrium, which will pump to the left ventricle. And then from the left ventricle, it goes out the aorta to the tissues of the body. In order for that muscle to contract, it's got to be electrically excited. So there's cells that are positioned in this heart that electrically excite the, the heart muscle itself. The primary control of the heart rate is what we call the sinus node or the sinoatrial node. It spontaneously generates electricity. And that electricity 
from the sinus node is going to be transmitted to the atrium, the right and left atrium. And once the atria are excited, they're going to do what? Anybody tell me. Once it's excited, the atria, it's going to contract. So the sinus node spontaneously generates electricity. Good job. Thank you. Spontaneously generates electricity. That electricity is going to spread over the atria. And then at that time, after that atria is excited, it's going to contract. So the right atrium will be pumping blood into the right ventricle at that time, left atrium into the left ventricle. And then once it reaches, goes through the atria, it's going to come down these bundle branches, right and left, where it's going to deliver that electricity to the ventricles. And then once the ventricles are excited, then they're going to contract as well. There's a little bit of pause. So the, as the electrical activity goes through the atria, there's a little bit of a delay from the atria to the ventricle. And that allows those atrium to completely contract. So the ventricles are really full of blood so that when they contract, they'll deliver to the lung, the right ventricle, or to the tissues of the body, a good cardiac output, a good amount of blood flow to the tissues, okay? So we think of the president, the sinus node, we call it Nick Fury. And then it's gonna conduct through the AV node, Captain America, all the way to the Avengers, which are the ventricles, okay? We can measure that. We can look at that electrical activity and say, okay, let's look at the sinus node, atrium, AV node, ventricle. We'll see if it's conducting like it should because it should be going in that pathway. And that's where we look at an electrocardiogram. So we do an electrocardiogram. Here's a little dog that we have. We put them on their right side typically. And then we hook up the ECG onto the animal's thoracic, the front legs, and the pelvic legs. And that's going to hook up to our ECG machine, and it's going to record electrical activity. From the heart, that electrical activity will be generated. We can pick it up on the body surface. So we can hook up this ECG on anywhere on the body. We do it on the limbs so that we minimize artifact but we'll pick up that electrical activity from the heart on the body surface anywhere, but on the legs, and it will record it and show us the electrocardiogram or the ECG. So let me show you here. So we have the primary control of the heart rate, the sinus node, it just spontaneously on its own generates electrical activity. It's going to conduct that electrical activity through the atria. As it goes through the atria, when we have our ECG hooked up, we see the atrium being excited electrically by this wave that's positive deflecting. We call that the P wave. That correlates with the atrium being electrically excited. And then it's going to go through this AV node where it's gonna be a little bit slowed. And then it's gonna spread down the bundle branches, the right and left bundle branches to the ventricles. And then we get a waveform that's called a QRS wave. And that corresponds with the ventricle being electrically excited. So we have our P wave atrium being excited from the sinus node. And then we have our ventricle being electrically excited with the QRS waves. And then there's a T wave where everything's returning back to its resting state so that it can be electrically excited again. So here's an electrocardiogram of a dog right here. And we have these P waves, QR, and then we have the T. P, R, T. So that's a normal 
And since it's coming from the sinus node, we call that a normal sinus rhythm. That's a sinus rhythm. So we have P waves, atrial excitation, and then we got our QRS waves, which are the ventricles being excited. And that should be all the time. That should be once, if that electrical activity is normally functioning, that's what we're going to see, these P, QRSs, and then, of course, we get a T wave. That's going to be repolarization, or the heart returning back to its resting state so that it can be excited. So that's our electrocardiogram. We look at heart rate. And for heart rate, we got a caliper. We use the big pin because that's a, the big pin with the cap on it. That's 150 millimeters in length. So if we run our paper speed on the ECG at 25 millimeters per second to determine how many seconds this pin is, which is 150 millimeters in length, you would go 150 divided by 25. That's six seconds of time if we run our paper speed at 25. If we have the paper speed at 50 millimeters per second, that big pin, 150 millimeters in length, divided by 50, three seconds. But we do beats per minute. So we use that big pin and we determine how many beats per six seconds or three seconds, depending on the paper speed. And then we multiply by 10 or 20 to get beats per minute, because that's what we obviously evaluate. So let me show you an example. Here's a dog. So you have to look at the paper speed, 25 millimeters per second. That big pin is 150 millimeters. So that's going to correlate with six seconds of time. So we count, there's our PR, we count the number of R waves that are within this big pin, which is six seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. So that's 11 beats per six seconds, but we want beats per minute. So 60 seconds, so we got to take that 11 times 10, 110 beats per minute. So this dog would have a heart rate of 110 beats per minute. Notice that there's a P, atrial excitation, R, ventricular excitation, repolarization, or getting back to resting state with the T wave. It's all the way across, you have a P, R, PR, atrium ventricle, atrium ventricle, atrium ventricle. So this would be an example of a, what type of rhythm? Is it normal? Yeah, it's a normal sinus rhythm. And we call it that sinus rhythm, good job, because it's coming from the sinus node. That would be normal. So that animal, we know the electrical activity is going through the um, anatomy of the conduction system normally. It's going from the SA node, atrial myocardium, down the AV to the ventricles. So that's normal. Now we look at heart rate and we know that normal heart rates, bigger the dog, the lower the heart rate, bigger the animal, the lower the heart rate. So horses, you know, they'll have 30 beats per minute as a, as a heart rate. Um, bigger the dog, the lower the heart rate. So we say if a dog has a heart rate less than 60 beats per minute, we call that a slow heart rate or bradycardia. And then I have the number for the cat less than 120. And then it's Fast heart rate, tachycardia, if it's for a dog greater than 180, for a cat greater than 220. So that SA node, that sinus node, will spontaneously excite the muscle, atrium, and then it goes down to the ventricle. But it's modulated by the nervous system. So you can imagine that during times of stress, the nervous system that innervates the SA node is going to make it fire or conduct electricity 
slower or faster when you're nervous? What do you think? Faster. Yeah, it's going to make it go faster. So during times of stress or during times of demand, if I go running, the, S the sinus node, SA node, is going to generate electricity faster so that our heart will pump faster and provide blood flow to my muscles. Conversely, when we're sleeping or during times of, of rest where we're not stressed, very relaxed, the autonomic nervous system will make that sinus node go slower, okay? So it all depends on your circumstance, but that's kind of a number that we use to say, okay, is the heart rate too slow, bradycardia, or too fast, tachycardia? Let's see some electricity going around. Here's two of my dogs. They're in this room with me. I'm hoping the male person doesn't show up and they start barking, and I apologize if they do, but this is Paisley. Um, Paisley and Dash, they're two Australian shepherds. We adopted Paisley. She came from a rescue. She had a little vessel that stayed open um, that should have closed after birth. So there's a what we call a ductus arteriosus that's normally there. Um, but when, when they're born, that vessel should close off and her stayed open. So she had a heart murmur and um, the heart murmur that she had, it sounded like a washing machine. So I'm gonna try this. We'll see if it works. So instead of the normal lub dub, lub dub that you would hear with the heart pumping, this one, you hear that murmur, that washing machine, washing machine sound that is due to that vessel that didn't close. So it sounded like a washing machine. So I wanted to name her Maytag because of the washing machine, Maytag washers. Um, my wife said, we will not name this dog Maytag. Nah. So she wanted to call her Paisley. So we call her Paisley May now. By the way, we closed that little vessel so we could close that up surgically. She's now five, I believe five years of age and she's doing well. And then this is Dash Dog or Dasher we call him. And he's, he's fairly healthy now. Okay, quick ECG. How do we interpret an ECG? Because you know we have atrial excitation, ventricular excitation, you know how to calculate the heart rate. So the first thing we do is we look at the heart rate and say, okay, is the heart rate appropriate? Is it appropriate for the circumstance that the animal's in? Or is it too fast or too slow? Bradycardia, slow, tachycardia, fast. And then, then we look and say, is the sinus node, Nick Fury, generating electrical activity to Captain America, the vice president? And that's where we look for the P wave. And then we want to see if the P wave is followed by this ventricular excitation. And that should be a normal sinus rhythm if that's there. And that's how it should be. It should be a normal sinus rhythm, maybe a little faster during times of stress or demand with exercise, maybe a little slower if you're really relaxed, sleeping. So here we go. Here's one I want you to try. So we're going to calculate the heart rate. I'm going to let somebody try it. Look, we're at 50 millimeters per second. So this big pin that's 150 millimeters in length is going to represent three seconds, okay? Because we do 150 divided by 50 at three seconds. So somebody calculate the heart rate on this. One. Is it 120? Very good, very good, 120. So it's a dog and we said, okay, maybe the heart rate should be, you know, around a hundred typically for a dog. 
it may be a little fast. So we would call that maybe a little bit tachycardic where it's a little fast. And then we look to say, okay, are there P waves for every R wave? And you would say, yes or no, P for every R wave. Yeah. Yes, I think so. Are there R waves for every P? Because just because there's atrial excitation doesn't mean the ventricles are being excited. And R, 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 yes. So this would be an example of a normal sinus rhythm. Okay, so that's normal. Electrical activity is normal in that dog. It's a little fast, not bad. Probably a little stressed from, from getting an ECG. But normal conduction through the, the, the conduction pathway. Let's look at a case. So here's a Roscoe, a four-year-old malneutered boxer, had a one-day history of lethargy and an episode of collapse where he collapsed with activity. And now we're gonna look at his ECG. We're at 25 millimeters per second. So that big pin's gonna be six seconds. So we go one, two, three, heart rate. Who's got a heart rate for me? One, two, three. We're gonna get about 30 beats per minute for the heart rate. So fast or slow for a dog? Slow. It's slow. So we got a bradycardia, heart rate's too slow. We say, are there P waves? for every R wave. And you'd say, there's one there, but look how close it is to that R wave compared to this one. See how they're different? So there's P waves there. Are there R waves for every P? No. No. So how does this electrical activity get from the atrium to the ventricle? It's got to go through the, you all remember what that was called, the node? The AV node. So what's happening is this electrical activity is being blocked at the AV node. So the sinus node is generating electricity. It's going through the atrium but then it's blocking at that AV node, and I'll show you. So this is an example of what we call a complete heart block. There's no Captain America talking to the Avengers because there's no R waves for the P. So this is what we call a complete heart block. What's happening is the sinus node generating electrical activity. So we get P waves. But then once it reaches the AV node, Captain America, that's not being conducted to the ventricles, okay? So that's what we call a complete heart block. Thankfully, the ventricles, these bundle branches can generate electricity spontaneously as well if the sinus node doesn't work. And that's why we have this ventricular depolarization, but or the ventricular excitement, but it's gonna be at a much lower rate than what the sinus node is, is functioning. So this is a complete heart block. So when the animal goes to exercise, the heart rate should increase, but none of the impulses are getting through the AV node. So the heart rate stays at 30 beats per minute. Therefore, the animal is fainting, right? It's fainting. It's having what we call syncope or fainting with, with exertion because there's not enough blood flow going to the muscles or to the brain. So the animal will faint. Captain America on vacation, not communicating like he should. And then the ventricles are firing at 30 beats per minute, which they should. 
So it's still in the ventricles. If those ventricles were not electrically excited, the ventricle wouldn't, what? If that ventricle was not electrically excited, it would not contract. Wouldn't contract. You're right. Good job. So thankfully, there's these ventricles, these bundle branches can generate electrical activity at a, they do, it's going to be at a much slower rate than what the sinus node does, but it allows that to be excited, the ventricle, and it allows it to contract, but it's going to just be contracting at a rate of 30 beats per minute. So keeps the animal alive, thankfully, but the animal is not going to have a good quality of life. So what we got to do is try to come up with a way to give this animal a good quality of life. And what could we do? Because you can't get rid of this. There's scar tissue in this AV node. So we need to put something in that we could function as a sinus node, if you would think like that. That way we could make the ventricle pace at a rate that's faster than 30 beats per minute. We need to electrically excite the ventricle faster than 30 beats per minute. So what can we put in? The yeah, that's where we use pacemakers. So good job. So we can put in a pacemaker, which is an artificial sinus node that we can program and say, okay, I want you to electrically excite at, and I'm gonna make up a number, but 80 beats per minute. And then it will transmit that electrical activity down a lead wire into the ventricle and function at 80 beats per minute. I'm gonna show you a dog. Here's a dog fainting. So turn your head if you don't like this, but here was a little dog that had fainting. And you can see they collapse and it'll look a lot like a seizure activity, but it's, it's due to low blood flow going to the muscles, he recovers and comes out of it, but they're gonna need a pacemaker when, when, they're, when their uh, heart rate's that low. So here's the pacemakers. I just wanna show you, here's a, the computer, what we call the generator, and we can program that to generate electricity at whatever rate we desire, and it's gonna transmit that down in a pacing lead, a lead wire. And then that lead wire is gonna be connected to the ventricles. And here's one. So you can see they're fairly small and we can program it to function or generate electricity at a rate of 80 beats per minute. What's cool is they have accelerometers in them so that the rate can vary. So it can control the rate and make it vary so that when the animal's active, and it starts moving, that accelerometer will be activated and the heart rate will go from 80 beats per minute to, and we program it to whatever, but I'm gonna say 140, but we can program it to do whatever. But so when the animal's sleeping, the heart rate can go down to 80 or 70, whatever I program it to, typically 70 to 80. And then it'll have that accelerometer. So when the dog starts moving, the heart rate will go from 70 to 80 to 140. So pretty cool. Here's the typical lead we use right here. And it has this little wire that's going to screw into the ventricle. And I'm going to show you. So we do anesthesia. We anesthetize them. So we have people that do anesthesia that are going to anesthetize the animal. They got this animal uh, on gas anesthesia. And then we're gonna make uh, an incision. There's two ways that we can put the pacemaker. We can either go through the vein, so we can go right through the jugular vein. So we just have to make a small incision over the skin to the jugular, and we can feed the wire through the jugular. And if you're a little queasy, I'm gonna show you a few pictures here, but this is the skin of the neck. There's the, uh, the jugular. And then we're gonna make an incision on that, just a small incision and feed that wire through. And then the generator is gonna go right underneath the neck, underneath the skin there. 
And here's an example of one that's in a dog. So the head of the dog would be up here. You can see the backbone, ribs, heart. And then there's the generator. And then the lead wire is coming through the jugular. And then it comes through the jugular, which empties into the right atrium. And then it goes across the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. And then you can see the little screw that screws right into the right ventricle. So this thing will be communicating to that ventricle. Sometimes the patients are too small where we can't put it through their jugular because their jugular vein is too small. And we do what we call an epicardial. So the outside of the heart is called the epicardium. And for those, um, we'll go through the abdomen and then we go across the diaphragm. And then here's the heart. And then we suture that on to the epicardium of the heart. In this case, the generator is gonna be in the abdomen. We have it in the abdomen itself. So if the animal's too small, epicardial. There's the heart rates we can program. So we can program it to whatever rate we want. It's got that rate adaption, we call it, but it has an accelerometer and it'll increase the rate with activity. So here's Roscoe. We put uh, transvenous, comes through, comes through. You can see it screwed right there into the ventricle. Now he came back in a day before he was to come in for his recheck. So about 13 days he comes in, he, was, he fainted again. We recheck his ECG and look what we got. We got a P, R, P, no R, P, no R. Mm. Let's see what happened. Here's before, because that thing screwed in. We're going just through the jugular and you're having to screw that in using x-rays to make sure you're in the right spot. Look what happened to the pacemaker. It came this right dislodged came out of the ventricle. So it was screwed into the ventricle, right ventricle, and it came out. So that's one of the, the complications that we see with the, with the transvenous is that that pacemaker can dislodge from that muscle. So we had to replace it and there's his second surgery. We can see the lead wire on the heart and then screwed into the ventricle, he's doing well. We typically follow up at two weeks to check the, the surgery site, and then we check them at six uh, weeks to adjust the pacemaker, and then usually yearly thereafter. We have a little machine, a programmer, that will communicate with that generator. So this little handheld device here will, will talk to the generator, and we can program it. So we can readjust the rate if needed, um, how much electricity it's taking to make the ventricle contract. We can adjust all that so that we can preserve battery life. Typically the battery life on most of the pacemakers are like 10 years. So they tend to be pretty good as far as the, the battery life. And then the ECG is gonna look totally different when you have a pacemaker because that pacemaker is generating electricity. So you'll get a really large, and it's gonna be pacing the ventricle. We get a pacing spike and then the ventricles, pacing spike and then the ventricles contracting. So that makes the ECG look a little odd. It's about $4,000 for a pacemaker um, to place some. They used to be donated from companies, not anymore. So um, we don't get very many donations, which is okay. Um, there's plenty available now, but um, the cost of that's about $4,000 to get the pacemaker. Okay, let me have you guys go to your kazoot, and I'm going to switch over so I can look real quick. Now I'm going to try this. I hope it works because I have not done this with Zoom. Hmm. Yeah. Kahoot. 
Okay, we got we got four. That'll work. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Start. Three, two, one. What is the primary pacemaker of the heart? What controls the heart rate? What we call the pacemaker of the heart. What primarily controlled that? Bundle of his, SA node, AV node, Purkinje's. Okay, question two. How do you get it to go to question two? Hmm. Can anyone else see the answers? Like the options? You didn't see it? No. No, we, I didn't. Okay, what's the primary pacemaker of the heart? Bundle of his, AV node, SA node, Purkinje fibers. What do y'all think? Sinus node. Sinus node. Good job. Normally I have the little clickers set because we're live, but anyway. Sinus node. What is the definitive treatment for complete heart block? Carvedilol, digoxin, atropine, hyoscyamine sulfate, or pacemaker? Pacemaker. Pacemaker. Yeah, good job. All right, that's what I had to present. These are my last animals that I have. We got some chickens. You met them. This is a unique chicken. We call him Master Rooster. He hangs out with the goats. Um, we got Obi-Wan, Luke, Qui-Gon, Jin. And then what would you name this one if you had any? Anybody? We call him Anakin because he's got a dark side and a light side. So that's Anakin. All right, any questions that you guys have? Thanks for coming and allowing me to share with you cardiology. If you have questions, let me see if there's anything in the chat. Nothing yet. I cheated, I put one in there early. <laughs> uh, any questions that y'all have? How common is it for a pacemaker to untwist and come out? Yeah, so good question. How common is it for it to dislodge, come out of the muscle? It's not real common, but that's the most common thing that we see. I'm going to say less than 5% of the time that it would dislodge, but um, that's the major complication of the, of the transvenous because we're going through the jugular vein. We're working outside of the animal, essentially. And then that thing screws in and it's just held on by that muscle with that, with that screw. And sometimes if you don't get it really good or if the animal's real active, that thing can pull out. And um, thankfully not too often that it does that, but that's the major complication. Um, they do really well with the pacemakers. And that's what I want people to know is that, yep, that's a, a very good option for patients. They have a good quality of life. Um, the main concern is that dislodgement, but we can put it back in. But most people worry about more extreme stuff happening. And that's my point is that, yeah, it, they tend to do really well and recover well and um, have a good quality of life after the pacemaker. Thank you, good question. Is it completely safe for the animal to have like 
it artificially electrocuted? Like, is that okay for the animal? Yeah, because the electricity that we're using, good question, is going to be, it's really low electricity. It doesn't take a lot to excite that uh, heart muscle. So it's like one volt typically is the, the voltage. So it's going to be really low. And so it doesn't impact them. But yeah, good question. It takes very little electricity to to uh, excite that heart muscle. So the animal doesn't feel it. it. It just allows that muscle to be excited so that it'll contract at that rate that we, that we program it to. Anything else you guys have? No, if my- you put a pacemaker, oh, sorry. Go ahead, no, go ahead. Okay, if you put a pacemaker on an animal, is there any way that you can take it off and it'll event, like, will it eventually not need the pacemaker anymore? Or once you put it in, it's gonna need it for the rest of its life? No. So typically, good questions, good questions. Typically when we put in a pacemaker, it's gonna be for those conduction disturbances where they're not gonna be reversible. So they're gonna need them lifelong typically. Um, the most common cause that we see for needing a pacemaker is where they get scar tissue. So age related, um, where that heart starts getting scar tissue in it and um, the heart rate gets too low. So you're not gonna reverse that typically. So it's gonna need those lifelong. But normally they're older. They tend to come in, you know, dogs usually around seven, eight, nine, ten, somewhere in that range, typically. Although I think Roscoe there was a little younger. So we do see it sometimes in younger animals, but most of the time it's going to be older animals that are going to need those. There is a question in chat, Dr. Thomas, and it says, uh, Ellie Cole asked if a pacemaker battery does have to be replaced, is it as expensive as getting a whole new pacemaker or is it just a good thing to always keep that date on the wall and you know when it's going to go out? Yeah, and that's why we check them. So when we check them every year, typically I put six months a year, but typically every year we check them sooner if we're worried about the battery life, but we can check that battery life so that we'll know. And if you do have to replace the battery, it's, you don't have to replace the whole system. You just have to replace that generator. So I'm gonna go back. You can still see my screen, right? Right, yeah. too far. You only have to replace the generator. So the lead wire would stay in place and then it would unscrew from this generator that's just beneath the neck. So it's really easy to place. So it's not expensive at all to replace that. Most of them have long battery life. So rarely do we encounter that anymore where the battery life becomes an issue. Most of them, they, you know, they'll have 10 years or longer often on the, on the battery life for those. If you were to replace the battery, would you go through the same incision site or go through a different area? Yeah, good question. So it, typically it'll be the similar. You may not be able to see exactly where it is, but it would be similar spot to where we went previously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, with some of the common problems you find, would they be a systolic or diastolic murmur? Yeah, so for the common heart conditions that we see in animals, and mainly dogs and cats, but we do see horses and ag practices, cows, goats, et cetera, and exotics. But the most common for dogs and cats, I'm gonna say systolic murmurs. So normally it's going to be when that mitral valve, let me go this. So left atrium pumps to the left ventricle. The left ventricle is going to contract to pump to the aorta. 
what's the mitral valve going to do when this ventricle contracts? Because this valve is going to keep blood from going backwards. So what's going to happen when the ventricle generates pressure to pump to the aorta? These valves are going to close. Yeah, they'll close. If those valves get degenerative, where they're not, where they're thickened, what will happen, which is common in dogs, is they'll get thickened and degenerative. Those valves close, but then they don't close, they don't form a tight seal like they should when they're degenerative. And what will happen is the ventricle contracts, pumps blood to the aorta, but then the valves will leak, and that's during systole when the ventricle is contracting. So that's the type of murmurs because the most common heart condition we see is mitral valve disease or degenerative valve disease, we call it. And that the, the murmur will be during systole. Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, also, is there a possibility that the pacemaker maker could be eroded or like moved? Uh, if it could be moved, we'll suture. So we'll suture it into the neck there so that it won't move. Um, so it won't move and then it's protected. It'll form a little fibrous capsule. The body will respond to that pacemaker that's uh, foreign material, obviously, but it'll, it'll form a capsule around that pacemaker. But yeah, we typically have it sutured. So it's ligated, tied down, if you will, into that neck. So it won't move a lot as far as out of that location. It'll move with the animal and that's what will, you know, stimulate the accelerometer. But that's a problem in people that they have because they'll take the pacemaker and they'll, they can twist it underneath the neck because they'll fill it and they'll be twisting it. And then, and normally it's up here on the chest in a person, but up here and they'll twist it and it'll, it'll, twist the lead wire and call it, cause it to, to come out, what they call uh, twiddlers, twiddler syndrome, where they'll twist that. But we don't see that. And we suture that pacemaker generator so that it's solid in place. And then it gets that capsule that forms and doesn't move. What else? I guess my advice for school to get into vet school, it's competitive. And I think focusing on what I would tell you is the science courses. So I think biology, chemistry, all the science courses that you can get, it's going to make you um, better prepared for vet school. And then I think working with individuals, looking for opportunities to um, maybe during the summer or whenever you have free time that you can work with a veterinarian and building those relationships, I think helps. Because one, it gives, it gives you an idea of, oh, I really enjoy zoo medicine or I really enjoy equine or ag practices, if you do cattle, um, goats, llamas, whatever, but it gives you that experience that I think is important, but then it also, you build relationships with veterinarians so that they can help guide you, mentor you as far as, um, making yourself competitive. So I think that those are what I would recommend heavy science. And then, um, just hanging around veterinarians, getting to know them, and looking for ways to to get involved in the in the community there with them would be helpful. I have one senior student, but she's local that I mentor at K State because she's local. She's in Manhattan, 
Um, I, I know her. She goes to my son's school. My son's in junior high now. I showed you those pictures where he's small. But anyway, he's in junior high. Um, so I, she's interested in vet med. I knew that. She goes to my son's school. She's a senior this year. And um, she reached out to me and said, hey, I get Fridays off afternoons. Can I come to the vet school and hang out and, you know, watch and kind of learn stuff so she'll come once uh well she tries to come every friday but most fridays she'll come and um we let her you know i have her in cardiology so we go through what we just went through and other stuff as well but i let her go through zoo um, ag practices equine um, community practice and that's getting her exposure to maybe what you know, what being a veterinarian is like, so that she's like, oh yeah, I really love this. This is really cool. Um, Cause that science, you know, you can do lots of other stuff besides vet med. So maybe she finds out, man, what I really love is pharmacology. I'm gonna be a pharmacist instead. Um, but right now she's a veterinarian. So, but that gives you that opportunity cause there's lots of stuff out there that you may decide that, you know, I really love radiology. I want to do ultrasounds and you could do that in, in people and it may divert you. Not that I don't want you to do vet med. I think vet med's wonderful, but you may discover that, you know, I love medicine, but I want to do ultrasound. So that gives you that opportunity. And then you get to know people so that they can help mentor you and kind of guide you through those career choices and um, kind of help you in that way. But so the, those are things that I think is important if you if you have time. The science of vet med, I think people, and I did it as a student, I think you underestimate it. There's a lot of science there that you would you think, ah, oh, it's a dog, cat, but we know a lot of stuff because we get help from medical doctors as well but there's a lot of stuff that you're going to learn that as a medical doctor they learn I mean the physiology of of the body and not just dogs but cats horses you're going to learn a lot of stuff and there's a lot of science there that um, you need to know so the more you have the easier so physiology um, anatomy could do veterinary anatomy that'd be awesome um that's going to be that that would help you when you transition to the to the curriculum dr thomason i want to be respectful of your time and i know uh these young folks have have obligations too but i want to take this time to say thank you so very much for taking time out of your very busy day and i I don't want them to forget about clinical research. I mean, the laboratory research, you know, that's, that's a whole nother thing. If you, that could even take you into translational medicine. Here's something that's applicable with animals. And I think, didn't this first come about uh, as a people solution? And then they found out that, oh my goodness, uh, my pet needs that. Can you do it for my pet? And um, a, lot of the, a lot of the studies are done in veterinary medicine first and then it gets moved to the human mm -hmm. obviously it's used for people most commonly because of price and etc but mm -hmm. um it does help both because it applies to to both and that's why i encourage people to visit veterinarians hang out because you may discover oh, i like that but i'd rather do like you said maybe research um so that's good to, to explore that and figure that out. Well, thank you very, very much for joining us. And I believe on the registration page, it showed you uh, Dr. Thomason's uh, email. If you've got questions, you can also send it to me. I'll put my email in here. If you have questions about either the One Health course that I listed earlier um, that is free. Um, we always like to look at One Health, public health, you know, we're all part of the same world. So um, 
keep your eyeballs open and, and develop your passion and think about veterinary medicine as a career. Yep, thank you. Thank yes. you. Good week.